So, <laughs> ScaleConf has got to be the only conference I've been to where the organizers walked up on the first day and they were all bare feet and in shorts. Um, but yesterday, um, Jonathan said that he'd like to hear next year from a lot more people that are local. And I just want to say that the last two guys that spoke, uh, Simba, it was, it's his first job, and he graduated last year from UCT. So Simba, thanks for speaking. The other thing about taking this spot is that Jonathan was probably sold insurance or cars sometime in his life because last week sometime he got me on Google Hangout and said, hey, how are you doing? Uh, there's a slot available. Um, it's the last slot of the day. We call it the armpit of the conference. So would you mind doing that? And I stupidly said, yes, I'll do it. Um, but the reality is that those guys over there are in charge of UX for the conference, so thanks for a great user experience, guys. <laughs> so, the other thing is that um, here, to the, in the last two days, lots of people have come up to me and said, oh, you're going to do a talk about Puppet, Puppet, Puppet. It's absolutely clear that nobody reads the abstract and everyone just reads the title, <laughs> right? So. This is not about puppet at all, um, not a puppet talk. So it's Cape Town, it's Friday afternoon. If you're hoping for a puppet talk, you can still beat the traffic just about. Um, oh, one last thing. Next to this uh, bottle of Jack Daniels, I found a little yellow sticky that says compliance. Um, anyway, yeah. So what are we here for? Who's heard of David Hume? Yeah, he's not a geek, philosopher, right? Scottish philosopher. So he has this famous experiment, which I'd like you to do. So um, for a few seconds, just close your eyes. I mean it, no one's going to steal your stuff. I know this is Cape Town, and so no one will steal your stuff. OK, the minions are walking around while you've got your eyes closed. Um, so close your eyes. Now imagine a child is born without any senses. No sight, no sound, no touch, none. None whatsoever. Imagine that we could somehow medically keep this child alive until the age of 18. Right? So there's no, no senses at all. At the age of 18, does this person have a thought? No, that's not part of this. You don't get Jack Daniels. Uh, so, so open your eyes. So, I mean, that's a crazy thought. I first heard of that experiment when I read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, and the idea is, where do you get thought from? Where does thought arise? And so there's many arguments. I mean, there's even a Reddit thread about this exact thought experiment. Um, I tried it on my family yesterday, and my son started asking me all sorts of weird questions, like how would you keep them alive, and all sorts of things. And that's not the point. The point is that where do we get thoughts from, and where do we get ideas, and how do they come into reality? Uh, the David Hume experiment goes a little bit further and says, well, if all thought comes from, from a sensory experience, from substance, what causes substance? And typically, like philosophy, it says, well, nothing, right? Um, and since this is the last session of the day um, and the armpit of the conference, I most probably can get away with just about anything right now. <laughs> so some of it is philosophical, which means that it's a great uh, way to get into the pub afterwards and discussions. <clears throat> so that's one of the Pink Floyd quotes. So not if you can hear me. Is there anyone in there? I'm also competing. I had a different slide deck. I threw that away, and this morning I started a new slide deck. Um, and I'm competing with the concurrency talk, which had about 100 and something slides, and I've got about 100 and something slides as well. So I'm wondering where we're going to go with this. So the thing is that some of us dream. How many startups in the room? How many people work for a startup? Wow. How many of you had a startup, your startup started this year? Well, last year, two years ago. 
When did you have your dream? So those dreams must probably start a long time ago. So some of us dream. Some dreams become ideas. And that's why you have a startup. And the thing is about being a geek is that we have the power. We have the power to make dreams come true. We actually can make dreams real. We can make ideas real. That is what we do as software developers. We make dreams real. We take an idea, we take a dream, we make it into an idea, and then we make it real. And then we can feel it and hold it and touch other people's lives with it. That is what we do. The problem is, can we handle that? Can we handle the fact that we have a dream? It manifests as an idea sometime in our life. We write some lines of code, it gets compiled, shipped down a continuous delivery pipeline, ends up on a server somewhere, someone touches it, someone uses it, and we affect their life. So, can we handle that? Do we dare to dream? Can you handle the responsibility of dreaming? That is a big question that I have for you today. And do we dare to design? Because that's the other side of dream, is to design. The dream is just this vapor, and the design is what makes it real. So do we dare to design? To make our dreams come true, unfortunately, our dreams must die. The moment it comes true, the dream is dead. To give birth to reality. Because once we take the dream, turn it into idea, turn it into code, the dream is dead. It's now real. It's gone. So our dreams are sacrificed in order to create a reality. Just because we dared to dream, and we dared to create, and we dared to give life to our thought, yet and I'm warning you, there's a whole bunch of lyrics in here, and I was wondering whether I should do the entire talk with lyrics. <laughs> Yet, the sun is the same in a relative way, and we're older, running over the same old ground, the same old fears. Again, Pink Floyd, the most uh, melancholic group around, I think. Um, and the reason why I took this quote is that uh, this thing about older kind of holds for me. Yesterday, I was sitting with Beat Schwegler, who was from Microsoft at, at Vida, and we're having a great chat, and a lady who was not part of the conference, who was visiting the gardens, came up, and she saw this, our scale conf tags, and she said, oh, you're, a, you're part of this. Do you work at last FM, right? <laughs> I was like, excuse me, I don't understand. She says, no, do you work at last FM? FM? And she had, a, she had a camera ready, right? And I said, no, unfortunately not. And Beard says, at least lie once in your life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And then there was another kid who was sitting next door drinking a frozen something or the other, and he says, are you a programmer? And I said, very nervously, I said, yeah, I am. And he said, why? He said, um, well, I also program. And he was like 10 years old, right? And he said, what do you program with? He said, Python. And then I remembered what Nicholas said about you can't scale the thing up. And I said, you better change. <laughs> <laughs> you better change, buddy. He didn't have a scalability problem at that time. <laughs> I just told him, it's coming. You better change. And it's not to Ruby. <laughs> so the thing is that we end up creating these dreams, and we take our dreams and make them real. And we end up with killing, actually, our dreams once it becomes real. And that's when we start running into the real reality of life. And then we start running over the same old things over and over again. Uh, thinking that it's new. So a lot of the challenges and things that I've heard of over the last two days and ScaleConf last year uh, seems like the same thing with different tooling and different challenges. And um, in many ways, it just seems to be getting harder and harder because the volumes, etc., increase. I've noticed a change in an increase in volume of maybe a few, maybe by 10 from last year in terms of what people are quoting. So the thing is that what was our idea is now a reality, and it grows, and it grows, and grows, and we get servers, and more servers, and we make more servers, and then we provision servers, 
And then we cloned them with things like Puppet, Chef, Ansible. Who's using Ansible, by the way, these days? Okay, no, the hipsters moved to that side. Okay, the cool kids. Um, so we end up provisioning and cloning and provisioning and cloning, and they end up with a whole bunch of servers and servers and servers. And we want more, and we do more, and we want more. And the question is, why? I think we scale because we can. Just because we can, we scale. Why aren't we satisfied that, ah, these are enough users for our business? We scale because we can, because it shows how powerful we are as people, and we can make these amazing things. But the problem is that our reality is then bigger than our original idea, and the dream is dead, our reality consumes us. We are its host, it needs more, it needs more, and then we hire, 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 and we recruit, 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 and we clone, 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 and we clone servers. And after a while, we clone people, and we're just another brick in the wall. And I don't know when you were born, but when I was born and I was in primary school, this another brick in the wall part two was banned because of the single line that says we don't need no education, we don't need no thought control. Okay. And so our ideas are tragedies, unfortunately. We clone servers and we clone people. We rob ourselves of our senses. We make us incapable of feeling. We are essentially remote controlled. We are remote controlled by process, by methodology, a science of management, by systems and isms for a reality that outgrew a dream. It is time to break on through to the other side. <laughs> please someone say that they know the doors. Please, please, please someone say they know the doors. So the reality is that we go from from actually having an idea and a dream, the dream becomes an idea, it becomes a reality. We get caught up in reality in such a way. We scale up from a few servers with a few people to hundreds of servers and hundreds of engineers. And we do crazy things like continuous delivery pipelines and all sorts of things. And at the same time, there's a few people who started the business who now have to deal with a multitude of people way beyond tipping point. And how do you manage that? And so management science comes up and we say, as well, make everyone look the same like our servers. I kind of don't like that idea. So the reality is that we don't need, we don't need preachers, we don't need politicians, we don't need remote control, but we are geeks and we suffer from one thing, man-machine love. <laughs> I want to leave it to you. You get a swig. You get a swig, man. <laughs> a swig. <laughs> that is the problem with us geeks, right? We love the machine. <laughs> so it's us, man and machine. And then love. And the question is that do we dare to love? We dare to dream, but do we dare to love? And what does it mean when we say we dare to love? It doesn't really matter right now, because after a while, it feels like a purple haze all in my brain. <laughs> Lately, things just don't seem the same, acting funny, and I don't know why. Eventually, you check out and you say, excuse me, while I kiss the sky. And then the moment when you kiss the sky and you find enlightenment and you realize who you are, and going back to David Hume, you realize that substance and causality of that is actually nothingness. You realize that that which makes us sad makes us happy, and life is actually a duality. And that which I, s and the side that I see is actually my choice in this duality. And when we see the same side, it is actually a moment that we shared. And only a moment is infinite. That is it. And that is why we say love is infinite because it's only in that moment when we share the same side of a duality. When we see opposite sides, then we think we're in conflict, we scale conflict far too easily and I don't know why. There is something as human beings that we just can't scale in an instant, conflict. 
And actually all we need is actually a subtle shift in attitude, a shift in perspective to see that duality from the other side. And that is something we all call empathy. And it starts with awareness. Just knowing the other person from the other side. Because there's things that make us sad, also the things that make us happy. It's just a subtle shift. When you shift perspective and you understand the person from the other side, you realize that there's actually nothing to fight about. And so you have a magic machine cannot match a human being, human being. It's an African idea, make the future clear. That's Johnny Clegg. Anyone knows which song that comes from? Locals. Come on. Scatterlings of Africa, right? Yeah. So that's Ubuntu. It's an African idea. It says that I exist because all of you exist in the room. I cannot exist alone. And the reality is that we are different. We stack our values very, very differently. Absolutely differently. So if I have to ask you right now, on a page, without looking at the person next to you, well, that's too complicated. It's Friday afternoon. I'm not going to ask you to write. So shout out, anyone. What's the one value you're not prepared to compromise in building a scalable system? Sanity. Sanity. Yeah. Design. Anyone else? Something you're not prepared to compromise, no matter what. If management comes and tells you release today and you're going to break that principle, you will not break that principle. Security. Security. Changeability. Changeability. I heard Python. Something. <laughs> um, so a few weeks back, I was in Sweden and I ran a workshop on diverse, diverse cultures. And I was warned that if I run this workshop about diverse cultures in Sweden, where everything is homogenous for 200 years of living in peace and harmony, there is no diversity. And I asked everyone to start writing down on a page and then flash it up like that. What, what is the one value you're not prepared to compromise in your design in code? And they're all from the same company. In a group of 20 people, there were 10 differences, 10 different things. Right. Then I asked them, what, would you, what is the one value you're not prepared to compromise as an organization? And again, we had, some, we had a high degree of variation. And we did the same thing for your team, for your family, and for yourself. You know what happened when I came down to what is one value you're not prepared to compromise for yourself? What was the majority? Blank. I don't know. They don't know what they're willing to compromise. The thing is that our values are stacked different, differently, but it shouldn't matter. Because what we actually want is for you to come as you are, as you were, as a friend, and even as an enemy, Nirvana. And that is all we are. We are actually unique. We cannot be cloned. We cannot be jacked in, remote controlled. But can you feel it? Can you feel that you cannot be remote controlled? Because something is happening and you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? That's Bob Dylan. So after decades of process and methodology of agile folly, being sold the dream of the team in the small and at scale from XP and Scrum and now Kanban and DAD and SAFE. But it is just Taylorism and it's in disguise and most teams work superficially well or are toxically dysfunctional. Why? Because we are told to leave our baggage at the door when we enter the building. Leave your stuff at home. Don't bring it in here, because those are not our values. Basically, that which divines me will not be ignored. Basically asking me to take that part of me that makes me unique and leave it outside when I walk into this building so that I can be part of the same team. I find that extremely difficult to do. I don't know about you guys. The moment you are being asked to leave your baggage at home, you are being cloned. You are being remote control and you're being jacked in. We are incapable of leaving our uniqueness aside. That part will always return. That part is, the part that is me prevents us from scaling like clones. We actually scale quite naturally as a human species because of our diversity, not because we are similar. We enjoy being with each other because we are different, not because we are the same. We may use the same tools and the PHP guys in that corner that have assembled quite nicely on their own, 
it's okay to come with the other languages that start with P on this side, like Python, and the three Perl guys in the front. We scale with diversity. We don't scale as human beings because we are clones and we all look the same and behave the same. It's impossible for us to do that. So I say that we should embrace our diversity. That is the revolution that is inside us. It cannot be suppressed. It cannot be avoided. You will not be able to stay at home, brother. You will not be able to plug in and cop out. You will not be able to lose yourself on Skag and skip, skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised. Who knows this one? Whoa, activists in the room? <laughs> so if all we want is happiness to be content, then, if that is all that we want, to be happy and be content, then I ask you one simple question. What is the basis for our dispute? If that is all that we each want. <laughs> I should never have given that guy that swig. <laughs> So I warned you that I could get away with almost anything, and I'm not sure whether I've gotten away with it, but the reality is what I actually want to just share with you is that no matter how much we actually try to be the same, try to live in teams that behave consistently, and it's, uh, I'm going to be anti-establishment, say management needs that consistency so that it can manage and treat people and, and control people in various ways. And there are organizations that are breaking that establishment and allowing people to be unique, embracing their uniqueness, etc. And so the only thing I want to leave you with is that let us not forget that we are human beings and we don't scale up the same way we scale data centers. We absolutely don't. No matter what process, methodology and tooling that we actually use. And if you find a tribe like the language that you like, the tooling that you use, it is just because we have some things in common but even within that group there's a deep seated differences between each person. At the end of the day, there's not much for us to actually dispute, apart from maybe VI and Emacs. <laughs> um, but I hear Sublime is the king these days. Um, so I'm going to end off right here. I'm not going to take much longer. I'm just going to leave you with a, with, a, with a Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, that says, if you don't change direction, you may end up where you're heading. <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing your time with me on a Friday afternoon. And if there's anything you want to chat about, I'm still sticking around, or you'll see me tonight, maybe. Thank you. Awesome. We have time for philosophical questions, and it was suggested by Hank that yes. every question has to be asked in rhyme. Exactly, uh, yes. No, Ben, you can, you, you can get away with it. Yeah. Hi. So, so, in Hume's uh, Treasure for Human Treaty, he argued that desire is greater than rationality. So maybe that's an example for why people still use Python, because they're not rational. <laughs> uh, that question is a statement. <laughs> Just say, is it um, would you agree? And ignored because it didn't rhyme. Um. You talked about the doors, but what about the windows? Uh, it's open source now. <laughs> Any more questions? They're just. Good one. I uh, thank you very much for that. Cool. Let's give. Um, let's give him a. Was and uh, that's awesome way to end the day. <laughs>